Good morning. The committee will come to order. I want to welcome everyone this morning as we gather to examine two pieces of legislation related to U.S. affiliated islands. This is S-2182, the Bikini Resettlement and Relocation Act, and S-2325, the Northern Marianas Island U.S. Workforce Act. So walking in this morning, a little bit cool outside, so we'll go to the South Pacific this morning. Now, our second piece of legislation this morning, S-2325, seeks to address the Northern Mariana Islands foreign labor concerns as we each reach the end of the transition period that was established by Congress. This bill was developed by a bipartisan, bicameral working group that I formed last year. That group includes two of our witnesses today, Congressman Sablan, we thank you, and Governor Torres, uh, as well as staff from our committee, the House Natural Resources Committee, and the House and Senate Judiciary Committee. So we appreciate the good work that many have put into uh, getting us to where we are today. S-2325 extends the transition period to 2029. It further sets a numerical cap of 13,000 CW permits starting in FY 2019 with, an, with annual decreases of 500 permits for the remainder of the transition period. Our goal is to ensure that U.S. workers in the CNMI are not at a competitive disadvantage compared to foreign labor. And to that end, our legislation requires a U.S. Department of Labor certification on foreign worker needs and requires that the employer pay a CW worker the highest prevailing wage. The bill also creates a new CW3 permit category for long-term foreign workers who have been working in the CNMI under a CW permit since 2014. And it gives the Secretary of Homeland Security the authority to revoke an issued permit if it's not being used or if the employer has violated federal labor laws. Now, the timing of this legislation is significant as we are only a few weeks away from the submission of the next round of CW permit applications. <coughs> Notably, the Department of Homeland Security has announced a significant reduction in the number of CW permits available in FY19, which is expected to result in the denial of thousands of applications. While I do believe that we have a good product in front of us, I welcome suggestions on how we might be able to improve it. I do want to emphasize, however, that while I'm willing to support extending the transition period, I remain committed to the intent of the, in of the transition, which is to increase the number of U.S. workers in the CNMI economy while reducing the dependence on foreign labor. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on these two bills. I thank uh, many of you for coming a long, long distance today. Uh, I turn now to Senator Cantwell for her comments and remarks. Thank you, uh, Chair Murkowski, for holding this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today to discuss Senate Bill 2325, the Northern Marianas Island U.S. Workforce Act, and S-2182, the Bikini Resettlement and Relocation Act. As the Chair said, I know many of you have traveled from far away. As many of my colleagues know, this committee was originally created in 1816 as the Committee on Public Lands. And in 1977, it was renamed by what we call it today, the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. So since its earliest days, this jurisdiction has encompassed territories and insular areas, and the scope of the committee's jurisdiction includes five territories, Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, America Samoa, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands. In addition, the freely associated states of Palau, Micronesia, and Marshall Islands. And today, the committee will consider S-2325, which would amend labor policies in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. It specifically addresses the Northern Mariana's only transitional worker permit program. The At last year's hearing, we revisited the shameful labor abuses of the 1990s and early 2000s and the actions this committee took in response to that under the leadership of then Senator Frank Markowski. We learned that some of these same abuses had returned with recent casino and hotel construction. And we also noted press reports about that indicated money laundering. Fortunately, in contrast to the 90s, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and U.S. Department of Labor were on the scene, and they made multiple arrests and put a halt to the abuse of labor practices, and at least five people have been indicted on charges of harboring aliens for commercial advantage and private financial gain. I expressed my concern at that time 
there did not appear to be sufficient oversight on the part of local government. Regarding potential money laundering, Governor Torrey has indicated that his administration was intent on strict regulatory oversight, and he committed to evaluating whether any changes in the local law and enforcement were necessary. So I look forward to hearing about the progress, Governor, at today's on this. This committee passed a bill last year which, upon enactment in August, would remove the loopholes which allowed construction companies to get CW visas. And during the past year, we have been working on a longer-term solution to the expiring CW program. So I'd like to thank Congressman Khalili Sablon for the Northern Marianas for his leadership in working this past several months in a bipartisan way with the staff of the committee and the Judiciary Committee to identify a path forward for a 10-year transition from the CW program. This bill, in my view, effectively promotes continued economic growth for the Marianas, but also imposes additional safeguards to make sure that protections are in place for workers. Those who mistreat their employees will suffer the, the consequences. The, bikini the federal government must ensure that the Northern Marianas has its tools to grow its economy while at the same time ensuring protection of the fundamental labor rights. So I view the Northern Marianas bill before us today as accomplishing both, but the local government must remain vigilant. So thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this important hearing. I look forward to hearing what the witnesses have to say today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. Let's turn now to, to our witnesses, a, a very distinguished panel. We uh, appreciate you joining us here this morning. We'll be led off this morning by the Honorable Doug Dominic, who is the Assistant Secretary for Insular and International Affairs at the U.S. Department of Interior. Nice to have you here. I mentioned uh, Congressman uh, Sablan, the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you for, for joining us and appreciate all your good work. The, the Governor for the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the Honorable Ralph De Leon Guerrero Torres, is with us this morning. Thank you for traveling so far. We appreciate it. And uh, as we do here, we would ask that you try to keep your comments to about five minutes, your full statement will be included as part of the record, and then we'll have an opportunity for, for questions and answers once you each have concluded your statements. With that, uh, Mr. Dominic, if you would like to lead us off this morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman Murkowski, Ranking Member Cantwell, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak regarding S-2182, the Bikini Resettlement and Relocation Act, and S-2325, the Northern Mariana Islands U.S. Workforce Act. I would now like to comment on S-2325, the Northern Mariana Islands U.S. Workforce Act. Uh, S-2325, among other provisions, would extend the termination date of the temporary Commonwealth-only, or CW, visa transition period by 10 years, raise the annual number of CW visas to 13,000 during fiscal year 2019, and create incentives to increase the percentage of U.S. workers. In recent years, there have been significant investments in casino and hotel facilities in the territory, increasing the need for labor. Since 2009, the CNMI has relied on this unique Commonwealth-only visa system, which is due to end in 2019. The Department applauds this legislative effort to increase U.S. workers. The administration is committed to working with the leadership and people of CNMI to ensure robust and healthy uh, economic growth and appreciates that a, uh, that a consistent labor market is essential. The Department looks forward to working with the Congress and the committee to provide long-term solution, a long-term solution to the CNMI's economic challenges, to protect and provide Americans and other U.S. eligible workers job opportunities, and to identify new opportunities for growth and diversification. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dominic. Congressman Sablon, welcome. Thank you very much, and good morning, uh, Chairwoman Murkowski, Ranking Member Canwell, Senator Heinrich, Senator Hirono and Senator Masto. Uh, thank you for today's hearing on S-2325, the Northern Mariana Islands U.S. Workforce Act. I introduced the same bill, H.R. 4869, in the House of Representatives, and we're looking at a hearing at the end of the month. My hope is the Senate will act so quickly that our hearing in the House can actually take up Chairwoman Murkowski's S-2325. And there is urgent reason to act. 
On April 1st, the window opens to apply for foreign labor permits for fiscal year 2019. USCIS has cut the permit cap in half, 5,000 below this year, and will close the window as soon as enough applications are received. This year, the window closed in just 11 days. Cutting the prospective foreign workforce in half will have an immediate, profoundly negative impact on the Marianas economy, which is now flush with growth after many years of decline. But Congress works well working against a deadline, and I believe we can move quickly now. Because the U.S. Workforce Act is the product of a bicameral, bipartisan congressional working group, and because the bill centers on two policy goals that should find broad agreement in Congress. One, the Marianas economy should continue to have the labor needed to continue development, and two, that the labor force should increasingly be composed of U.S. workers. To provide the necessary labor, the bill extends the current transition period for another 10 years and resets the permit cap to last year's level of 13,000. To incentivize hiring U.S. workers, the bill reduces the cap by 500 per year. To further protect U.S. workers, the bill requires the U.S. Department of Labor to certify the need for any new foreign worker and certify that they will not pull down the wages of U.S. workers. And to help make U.S. workers more employable, the bill increases the annual fee paid by employers to fund apprenticeship and vocational programs and requires an annual spending plan with specific job placement targets, plan approval by U.S. labor, and performance reports. Of course, another way to get U.S. workers is to look to the mainland U.S. or to Hawaii and Alaska. Chairwoman Murkowski, I know you have a native corporations. You have native corporations who do construction and are always looking for opportunities along the Pacific Rim. I hope the governor will look to Alaska for roads and other infrastructure projects the Commonwealth is building. The U.S. Workforce Act also requires periodic touchback to in their home countries by foreign workers to reaffirm their non-permanent, non-immigrant status. At the same time, the bill protects those foreign workers. When I testified here last year, federal agencies, OSHA, Labor Suites, and our division, Department of Justice and Immigration, had recently found serious violations of federal law at a major Chinese casino project in the Marianas. Also last year, the Department of Justice successfully prosecuted multiple businesses that were fronts for illegal recruitment and contracting schemes, which I would call human trafficking. The U.S. Workforce Act tackles those problems head on. From now on, employers must present evidence to federal agents every three months that foreign workers are being paid and all terms of con and conditions of employment are being met. And employers who are in breach of federal or commonwealth labor laws or not using their permits will have them revoked so legitimate businesses can have those permits. Of course, we may have some fine tuning to do. We will be meeting with Homeland Security in the next few days and the Labor Department. But all in all, we have a good bill. We wanted to be sure the economy would have workers. Our bill does that. We wanted to be sure that more Americans would be getting jobs. Our bill does that too. And once again, I thank you, Chairman Murkowski, Ranking Member Canwell, and all the members of our Congressional Working Group. Today, it seems we live in an age of division, but this bill reminds us, with effort and goodwill, agreement is within our reach. And of course, Chairman Murkowski, you and I shared the experience of working successfully together as we did on the transfer of submerged lands in the Marianas in 2013, the Rota Park study in 2014, extending the labor transition period from 2014 to 2019, and last year on H.R. 339, my bill barring the use of CW workers, permits for new construction workers. None of that legislation was easy, and the U.S. Workforce Act may be the most difficult to vote. But I look forward to continuing to work with you. I'm confident we can be successful again. Thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me this morning. Thank you, Congressman. Appreciate you being here. Governor Torres, good to see you. Good morning, Hafede and Tiro. On behalf of the people of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, I want to thank Chairman Murkowski, Ranking Member Cadwell, and all the senators, distinguished members of this committee, for recognizing the need of this important conversation for the community and the economy of the Northern Mariana Islands through the Northern Mariana Islands U.S. Workforce S23-25. 
I am here today to speak about our transition into the U.S. immigration system, the progress we have made towards the highest ratio of U.S. workers to foreign workers in our short history, the challenges we have arose in pursuit of even higher numbers, and how this bill provides for time and resources to make the goals of this transition period possible without harming the economy or the people of the CNMI. If you look at the data available to us from USCIS, we can see that within the listed CW occupations, economic growth, local government policy, and efforts have been reduced the demand for many job categories. For instance, in 2013, Northern Marianas College successfully launched a four-year bachelor's degree in business with training in accounting. This time frame saw accounting position in the CW program fall from eighth highest in demand to 15th in 2016. From teachers to retail workers and throughout the economy, since the beginning of the transition period, the CNMI has made gains towards the reduction of our reliance on foreign workers. The GAO study speaks to this as well as finding that the domestic labor force in the CNMI is nearly half of the total workforce, increasing 11% compared to 2009. The bill provides for protection of U.S. workers in our labor force through measures that are necessary for the CNMI to more adequately hire and retain U.S. workers through wage standards. The creation of the 3W3 category recognizes the importance of CNMI long-term foreign workers and will be crucial towards providing the next generation of U.S. workers on the, on the job training that was essential for the success of our economy. And allowing only legitimate businesses to acquire foreign labor on the CW program is an important step toward economic growth that is clean, sustainable, conducive to the safety and well-being of our community. Most importantly, this bill provides the CNMI and the federal government the time to grow our economy and succeed in our shared goal of building a strong, sustainable U.S. workforce. Because even after all the gains we have made since I come in, came into office, in the absence of this bill, Chairman, the CNMI would not be able to withstand losing half of its workforce in 2019. The JGO, GAO, I'm sorry, GAO has already found that without CW1 workers in CNMI, we stand to lose as much as 62% of our GDP. The effect of this massive economic collapse will be profound. We estimate that if the economy contracts by this amount, we stand to lose 25% of our U.S. workforce as a result of business closures an even greater amount of the outward migration of U.S. workers that will follow. With that, our data shows a potential reduction of 59% of local revenue. That will potentially leave the CNMI with an annual operating budget of less than $100 million before paying our debt services obligation and payments to our federally administered pension settlement fund. I have witnessed tight budgets in the past, the government austerity measures, the inability to pay for gasoline for police cars, and the, line, the long lines of the food stamps office. This would be far worse. This year we saw the need for greater data, more accountability, and better assurance that these funds were going toward a training of our workers. So we have implemented direct funding mechanism to students to subsidize the cost of training and track their progress because they are an important product of our work. We have many limitations in the CNMI that are not present in the state. We do not have Department of Labor unemployment statistics like a state. We do not have U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey, but through the funding assistance we have made, able to produce occasional data that give us some light. Most recently, the CNMI Department of Commerce released 2016 Household Income Expenditure Survey, which projected that there be estimated about 1,800 U.S. citizens in our islands that potentially classified as unemployed. While 1,800 relative small number, it is my hope to eliminate this number as best we can. To do so, we have instituted the strictest work requirement on food stamp recipient in the nation. We have promoted government-sponsored job fairs and, con and continue to allocate dollars to training institutions and programs. We have targeted issues that are affecting U.S. citizens' employment, started a first drug court and drug rehabilitation outpatient facility and are working towards implementation of the CNMI's first public transit to alleviate the transportation issues that are preventing individuals from obtaining a job. 
This bill represents a comp compromise on issues that a CNMI feels merit considerations. In our issue, initial proposal put forward the collaboration of the CNMI business community, we requested a numerical, numerical limit of 15,000, which would allow for greater growth in the level of current rate and removal of the construction workers ban on CW1 permit to allow the existing private contract more critical in public service infrastructure development and continue to on the survey, on the um, schedule. <laughs> All together, Madam Chair, thank you very much for this opportunity, for giving us this time to, to represent and to testify on this August body. Thank you, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Governor. Welcome. Okay, we got some stuff to work on here. Um, first of all, thank you all for, for your, your statements here. Um, I, I do recognize that five minutes is, is a limited opportunity. Hopefully we can get more of the information out through the questions and answers. Out, so I'll, I'll turn to Senator Cantwell, but we'll come back on thank this. You. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Governor Torres, last year when you were here, we discussed the Best Sunshine Live Casino, which operated in the Imperial Pacific International, was operated by uh, Imperial Pacific International Holdings, and it was under federal investigation for money laundering. And as you know, in September of 2016, the casino was operated out of a strip mall on Saipan and was reporting earnings that were eight times that of Macaw's largest casino. In your response to questions, you talked about local mechanisms uh, to prevent this type of fraud. You said the Commonwealth Casino is preparing legislation to present to the legislature, and you stated it would be a two- to four-month process. Can you update us on that effort? Sure. Thank you very much. We have learned our, our issue with the Dynasty of Money Laundering. Um, well, I'm proud to say that the regulatory structure and state of technology of the CNMI has put into place to protect our people by having the Gaming Commission work with our, with our federal agencies and making sure that all those regulatories that have been in place are followed through. Uh, we continue to work with our federal agencies in all the, all the monies that has been, um, been rolling in, in the CNMI. So um, I'm proud to, to announce that. So you consider the problem fixed? I, well, I think, I believe that the problem has been addressed more seriously by having our federal partners be part of our uh, gaming industry on any issues that, that they have concern, it's open. We have open books. Uh, they are always welcome to come and join the Gaming Commission on the floor or the vault or any, any issues that uh, the federal agencies have. I, I understand that you have a lobbyist and that they file disclosure reports that they met with the U.S. Department of Treasury. To your knowledge, did they meet with the Financial Crime Enforcement Network? I don't, I don't believe I have a, a lobbyist in terms of, uh, I'm not aware that there's a lobbyist. Okay, but I may find out and, and get that to you at the end of the week. Uh, these are the lobbying disclosure forms. Did they meet with others at Treasury regarding lobbying on money laundering violations? Not that I am aware of. Can uh, you get back to us on I that? I will definitely and get back to you. I, I guess the, the issue that we want to see, we don't want to see the Mariana Islands trying to get Treasury to not enforce the law. We need, as you said in the last hearing you attended, we need strong issues here. The violations uh, were outrageous, and so we need to keep moving forward on this issue. Thank you, Senator. And I, I'm proud to, to announce that because of our learning of our issue that was um, to experience last year, we have signed a U.S. contract contractor to finish the, the hotel of the casino um, that was signed, uh, I believe, less than a month ago. That will be hiring more U.S. workers uh, to finish the construction uh, of the hotel site. And what about, and where are we with, um, we also talked about labor practices. How are you ensuring that employers are held accountable for predatory practices against workers? Madam, I, I thank you again for the question. Um, as well as stated earlier, we do have the Department of Labor Secretary here today with us, along with our businesses, Marion's Business Alliance. We mandate our employers to have their employees' documentation available at any given time that those documentations are requested. We have met with the major industries 
and we are strict on making sure that those employees that continue to get used workers, but also that their documentation are legitimate. Do you believe that there are still unpaid workers remi remaining on the island? I would have to say that I am not sure. I know that those issues that was addressed last year uh, were being paid. I'm not aware of any other labor um, that are not being paid. Dr. Gutnick, do you have any comments here? Uh, with respect to the um, issue of um, financial crimes, uh, there is no Treasury representative in the Marianas, so a lot of the weight of enforcement is going to fall on the U.S. Attorney. We haven't formally studied that issue. With respect to the um, worker abuses that were identified last year, I, 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 would th I think that the, sunshine, the, the sunlight that was shined on that problem last year was significant. It got a lot of public exposure and a lot of public attention, and I think that, in addition to the enforcement concerns, was helpful in raising the awareness of the, the fed, federal government and, and many others about these concerns. Well, Madam Chair, I know my time has expired, but I will just say that these lobbying reporting say the client is the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. So, Governor, if you didn't hire them, I'd like to know who did. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. Uh, Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome back, uh, Congressman Sablon. Uh, it's uh, been a long time since we served together on the House Natural Resources Committee, but you've, uh, <laughs> you've been incredibly dogged and determined into in moving legislation for uh, CNMI over the years through some pretty hard to navigate Congresses. And I think you deserve credit for that. And I want to step back for a moment from this legislation that we have in front of us and just ask you what, what else would be useful in the relationship between the U.S. and CNMI in terms of creating a more sustainable economy uh, that benefits the, the citizens of CNMI? Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I agree that at the moment, the Northern Marianas does need access to um, workers, third country national workers. Uh, we have spent months in trying to come to agreement on what is now the product of the, the bill we're hearing. It hasn't been easy. There's been, at the beginning, the word I received was, last summer was no extension. And thank God for a, a lot of people who allowed me to speak. We do need this extension. I, and the reduction of workers on an annual basis because we do need to get U.S. workers into the workforce. And I know that the last time we had a hearing, we were told there's no U.S. workers. We've done everything we tried. We've reached as far as Puerto Rico. The GAO report just showed that we had an increase of 10% in U.S. workers, or 1,000 U.S. workers added to the workforce each, in each of the past three years. The termination of the program in 2019, which is the product of the chairwoman, was to put a hammer down and said, you get this program fixed. And it has forced employers to get serious and to look at U.S. workers. Now, there are many programs, apprenticeships that I would hope, that would get U.S. workers into the workforce and, and train them. That's the intention of even the local law when we had U.S. immigration I mean, when we had control of immigration, was for non, for third country nationals to come to work in the Marianas and train U.S. workers. But there was very lax. It wasn't the time, it was in Governor Torres' time in office. But the training is very important. Now, the continual thing is drop our arms and said, we can't find U.S. workers. That needs to stop. It needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. Now, this bill, I think, is the product of that. It would spur us into getting a Northern Marianas economy that would have um, 
U.S. workers as the main workforce and that third country nationals will come in to fill the gaps where there are really no U.S. workers. Uh, I hope that, that that's helpful. Um, Madam uh, Chair. For Congressman Sablon, regarding the, uh, the worker permit, um, you know, I think you, you mentioned that you're talking about the, a need to, to increase the CW visa cap for public health reasons. Can you talk a little bit more about the situation uh, in CNMI and why you need to raise the cap so that you can take care of the, the residents' health? Yes, give me a ride, Macy. Yeah. Okay, Senator. Yes, yeah. I'm um, in, in HR 339, which is now public law, we actually um, gave USCIS, we reserve a number of, of um, permits for public health and engineers for our power plant. Uh, that bill took a lot of time in getting through Congress, and when the time came, it was a little, um, uh, just a little bit late. We had a month, and uh, they, many of them didn't use it. Many of the nurses actually at the hospital decided that, hey, they actually got time off, vacation time off. They just got paid a retroactive pay for back pay, and so they, many of them decided to go home for 30 days and, you know, vacation and get uh, reapproved for, well, under the new CETA permits that uh, started in the next fiscal year. Um, Madam Chair, if I may, um, because I forgot to do earlier, if I may insert for the record, um, I have 14 here and I think you have more uh, testimonies of people supporting uh, your bill. Thank you. But uh, that's why, Senator Hirono, we tried to re uh, support that. It was for nurses and uh, engineers at our public power plant. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hirono, and thank you for, for raising the issue of, of, of Medicaid out there. Uh, we recognize the importance there. Senator Cortez Mesto. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for, for being here today. And I know many of you have traveled a, a long way. I, um, I have about a minute left, so let me jump over to um, Governor uh, Tories. Um, Governor, this is a difficult uh, problem. It's, it's about the supply and trying to get workers there and doing everything you can to obviously uh, make sure there are American workers. But if American workers aren't coming to do the job, you need somebody to do it. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And I understand that you also held uh, off-island recruitment of U.S. eligible workers, um, in, including in Las Vegas, where I represent Nevada and from Las Vegas. Is that correct? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges you are having in getting people and recruiting uh, Americans to come um, to the island to work? Sure. So we're 8,000 miles away from here, um, traveling just so that uh, it took me about 30 hours to travel here to D.C. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, I would like to acknowledge we have the business, Northern Rams Business Alliance with us. One of it is the uh, Pacific Imperial, which is our casino. Uh, a couple of years ago, they spent close to $1.5 million going to Las Vegas, Atlanta, New Jersey, trying to recruit for their gaming because gaming in Saipan is obviously the first industry. We don't have the experience, we don't have the knowledge um, on operating uh, the gamble, uh, dealers and so forth. Uh, out of 1.5 million, I believe they only were able to hire 147 employees. Uh, six months into uh, their recruitment, we hit a, a worse typhoon in history. Uh, and it was a disaster for the CNMI. It took about six months to restore back the power. Um, right after the, the disaster, 90% uh, of them left within 30 days. Um, we have other, other uh, Kensington is another industry that went down to FSM, who's also tried to get employees. But it's very difficult to get employee, U.S. workers out here in mainland because of our minimum wage, and of course it's far from home. Minimum wage is not as competitive as some of the islands around. We Correct. We're at Guam. It's about fourteen dollars or twelve dollars. Okay. Um, ours is uh, seven fifty-five. Thank you. I know my time is running out, Mr. Gutnick. Did you have anything to add to that? Only that, uh, along with federal control of uh, immigration, there was the application of minimum wage laws in the Mariana Islands in two thousand and nine, I believe, 
And at the time, the, the wage was $3 an hour. It's now, this fall, going to merge with the federal minimum wage at seven twenty-five. There was a belief at the time that raising the minimum wage to the U.S. minimum wage would attract uh, U.S. workers to the Commonwealth. I'm not sure that there's a lot of evidence that it's done that, partially because of the uh, Guam and Hawaii minimum wage. But we still see that a very high percentage of the workers in the Mariana Islands are, are making the minimum wage. It's, I believe it's roughly 60%. And of foreign workers, it's a higher percentage. So it's hard to get people to come all that way for U.S. minimum wage. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for the conversation today. And let me just finally add, labor protections obviously are so important. And I know not only you have a U.S. attorney there, but you have an attorney general who I've worked with in the past. Um, I, I think it's so, to me, this is my concern and many of my colleagues to make sure we are not exploiting the labor. I don't care whether they're American workers or foreign workers. We need to do everything we can to protect that labor force. So thank you for, for coming today. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Murkowski, and thank you all of you for being here and testifying before us today. I appreciate it very much. And um, Governor Torres, I have a question for you. Um, I understand that last year um, I saw a report that OSHA, the federal agency that oversees worker safety, of course, the United States, has found extremely dangerous working conditions at one of the largest construction sites um, in the CNMI. And in fact, I understand that three employees died after being exposed to um, hydrogen sulfide gas in a, in a confined space. Um, and also that apparently the FBI raided the construction site after reports of um, workers' deaths. So, you know, I know that everybody on this committee believes that um, any workers anywhere in the United States um, should have a safe workplace to, to be in. Could you just tell us a little bit about what has been done since last year to stop this kind of abuse? Thank you for the concern and the question. Um, Senator, that issue was a rude awakening for the community, especially for me as well as a governor. We've worked well since then with the owners of the industry. We've worked with the Department of Labor to make sure we meet on a monthly basis, making sure that those construction workers are treated fairly right, the right way, and making sure that their wages are being paid on time. We have the Department of Labor here as well, our secretary, to and we mandate the employers to provide proper documentation on all the, all the employees, whether the construction workers are working in the casino industry. Uh, I believe that since then, uh, we've, been, we've met those regulations, and we've been good uh, in making sure that we don't repeat those. Mm -hmm. And you haven't had any, I mean, do you, can you see some sure. evidence of, um, of improvements? Uh, yes, yes, mm -hmm. Your, uh, yes, Editor, sorry. Fine, thank you. Um, I have another question that relates to um, um, it relates to the, the challenges around um, ar around like who gets temporary um, um, work you know who gets the visa who, how we, how you work around the visa caps issue that you're dealing with. So I understand that last year um, foreign construction workers claimed many of the allocation of visas, and I understand that you know you have high need for this, um, but that that has also caused some shortages in other areas that are particularly important, um, um, especially in the public health arena. Um, and so could um, could you tell me whether the bill that you're talking about supporting today, you know, which includes provisions to make sure that CW visas don't all go to one industry um, and leave a shortage in other areas, can you tell me you know, how you think that might help? Thank you very much. Um, what we have here is a bill that, that gives protection for U.S. workers and also the need of continued contract workers the construction workers that we have um, are not allowed or banned into the CW workers, uh, and they're, we're moving forward and giving them the H-2B visa. That will open up more occupations to address our shortfall on other areas uh, of occupation, whether it's nurses, engineers. Uh, but I want to just point out that we do need construction workers for our government um, projects, like for our EPA regulations that are mandated, uh, we need those uh, construction workers uh, t to fill out our infrastructures. Mm -hmm. And are you looking for some consultation with the um, you, between between you and Homeland Security on how this all ought to work? Yeah, we we continue to have a, a good dialogue uh, with our secretary and assistant secretary. Okay. Uh, 
in addressing those issues of occupations and how do we best make our our CW workers uh, in the CNMI with other occupations. Mm -hmm. And you're getting the assurances that you would hope for that because it seems to me that it's important that um, local understanding and and um, wishes are considered. Are you getting what you what you need? You think? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Smith. Let me just continue on uh, with some of the questions as they uh, surround our situation in CNMI. Um, Dr. Gutnick, you had mentioned uh, in your testimony the, the discrepancy between the, the number of unemployed. Uh, you had cited uh, 2,400. Uh, the governor had cited a figure of, of 1,800. But as I understand from that, uh, your numbers include the FAS workers in addition to the U.S.? That's correct. Okay. And then based on the data that, that you have provided us, you estimate that 2,352 CW workers would be eligible for the proposed new CW3 permit. Does the, ad, does the data that you've been um, uh, reviewing indicate what kind of occupation those permit holders are engaged in? Yeah, we have some very preliminary data on that. Um, and not surprisingly, these are workers uh, from the Philippines and workers in the tourist industry. Now, uh, I, we, I did take a look, again, very preliminarily yesterday at the number of construction workers who would qualify under the three-year permit. And there is a very limited number, 160 or so. Now, the, the restriction in HR 339 is for folks who've been there from 2015. The restriction in this for the three-year permit is folks have been there for 2014. So they're not exactly analogous numbers. But the point is the, the three-year permits will not go to construction workers by and large, and they will typically go to the workers that are the core of the main industry of the, the, the main uh, uh, economic engine in the Commonwealth. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, a question uh, directed to, to either you, Governor, or Congressman, um, with a 10-year with a uh, extension of the transition period as we are proposing in our legislation, do you know of any reason why employers would not seek to, to move long-term CW workers uh, over to an employment-based uh, permanent worker visa? And my understanding is, as we've talked through this is that this could take um, maybe three to four years, maybe four years at, at most. It would then free up additional CW permits for other employment needs. Could you speak to this? Let me uh, take a, a first uh, answer that I have, Congressman. I would like to, to uh, Madam Chair, thank you again. We have the Northern Marana Species Alliance with us today. Uh, they have assured us they're 80 percent of our total revenue, yet they only constitute 25 percent of their contract workers a CW. So that makes a big difference on, on how they approach U.S. workers versus CW workers. They continue for the last three years or so. We have more U.S. workers today than we've ever had in the past 10, 15 years. The importance of this extension will continue our success on what we have done in the last several years because it is important for us as a community, as an island, and also the business partners understand how important it is for U.S. workers to be part of the community. Yet, in order for us to continue increasing U U.S. workers, we need the, the additional extension and, of course, the number of CW workers. Mm -hmm. Congressman, you want to add anything? Um, uh, yes, I'm, if I may. Thank you very much. Um, and, and this is apropos, I guess. Uh, two weeks ago, um, a man who came to our office some four years ago um, asking on how he could convert into a status that is not no longer temporary. And of course, we don't provide legal opinions or provide legal advice, but we did you know, tell him that there are programs, EB programs, that takes three, four years. And, um, and we provided this gentleman the forms. Only lo and behold, two weeks ago, he came into our office and was just gleeful, and he gave us a copy of his green card that he, he copied his green card and showed us and said, well, 
it was because I came to your office and that I'm no longer a CW worker. Finally, I have a green card. And went through the EB process, and it took him some four years. And um, he actually hired a lawyer to help him do it. And so there are many who could qualify. Uh, but Madam Chair, when people are just dependent on CW, people are just really saying this program will continue beyond 2019, you, your decision to stop it. And I hope that it doesn't now come to well. When we come to 2029, there will be another Congress and we could just get another extension. That I, is the least of my, my desire. Is we, this bill is designed to encourage U.S. workers and that non-U.S. workers, third country nationals, will fill in the gap where they are needed. That has to revert, that's a reversal of the present condition or works, working environment in the Northern Marianas now. And I know it for a fact, and everybody hates me for saying these things, but it's the truth, and no one here can deny that. Now, is there a shortage of this there? Do we still have a need for third country nationals? Yes, we do. That's why I'm supporting this bill. That's why I spent months since last summer working on this bill, because yes, there is still a shortage. But in the next 10 years, Madam Chair, God forbid that we will come back here or somebody will come back here and say that we still need U.S. workers. Because I will, like that gentleman, spend my own money to come here also and remind Congress of what we've gone through, 20 years of transition, and not just that, another 20 years of control over immigration. When they passed that legislation in the third, leg in the third legislature, I was the only member who voted against that bill because it didn't have controls. And I saw that the influx, the door was gonna open, and all the influx. I voted no against that bill that opened the Northern Marianas to third country nationals. Not because we didn't need it, but because there were no controls. But this bill, the one we've worked on, I think provides sufficient controls to encourage, to suggest, to urge companies to hire U.S. workers. They have done so in the past three years, um, an increase of 1,000 every year of U.S. workers in the workforce, U.S. workers. And, and that's only because, thanks to you, you have said 2019 is the dead timeline, and this is a, a timeline that's not going to move. Fortunately, we're here, and I agree. We need another 10 years. But um, again, God forbid that we we'll ask for more after this. I agree. I don't, want us, I don't want us to be here 10 years from now saying we haven't we haven't yet addressed the issue yeah. that we see very well in front of us. Let me As ask. it relates to, to uh, CNMI and our legislation, again, I thank you, Governor Torres. I thank you, Congressman Sablan, uh, for your willingness to work with us to, I think, get to a good place. I think we had some good testimony today. I think we recognize that uh, CNMI has come a long ways o over the years in terms of labor practices, uh, in terms of working aggressively to ensure that, uh, as, as you say, Congressman, we've, 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 changed, um, we've changed the dynamic there in terms of, of, of U.S. workers and the expectation that we will have more U.S. workers. So I feel that we are on a good trajectory here. It would be my hope that we can address this, this soon um, because as, as we have uh, been told by Dr. Gutnick, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the numbers and the uh, applicable um, uh, uh, visas that are out there, waivers that are out there, um, those numbers get snapped up pretty quick here. So this is something that we do want to, to continue our engagement with you and work to find uh, good, solid um, solutions. So again, as you say, Governor Torres, we're not back here 
10 years from now saying we need yet another extension. So we're working on this together and, and I appreciate that. And with that, gentlemen, uh, the committee stands adjourned.